Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Warm welcome to my brothers and sisters in Christ. What a joy uh, to be a family and journey to glory together. Some of you, 22 years uh, in this body and just such, such agape love I have for this bunch. I'd like to give a special welcome to any guests who are here this morning. We're always grateful to have you come uh, worship with us. I want to continue to pray for the homebound. We have a growing list of some of our brothers and sisters whose health does not allow them to be here with us in worship, so we want to continue to lift them up. This morning, we're going to take back up in our study through Romans, so if you'll turn to Romans chapter 8, if you're visiting, we've been studying through Romans for about two years, uh, and we have made it to chapter 8, and we kind of got stuck in verses 12 through 13, but this morning, we are going to finish those verses up, Lord willing. Um, we're going to um, look at look Romans 8, 12. Let me read it. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And we're going to pray now and just ask God to make us an assembly of saved sinners who are now children of God, putting to death that which offends and is against our father and our brother and the spirit that indwells against us. We are now enemies against sin, and we are learning in this section by the spirit how to put it to death. And so let's ask God to continue to meet us uh, and transform the children of God. Father, I thank you for the book of Romans. I thank you for thousands of years, Lord, you've used it to awaken sinners. You've brought revivals into this world. And even now in our own midst, Lord, you are stirring our hearts anew and afresh to behold this gospel and to be transformed uh, by that beautiful Christ as we behold him. And so I pray this morning, Lord, that you would help us to finish this section up, God, and that the fruit would be brothers and sisters in Christ putting to death these things that fight against you and fight against your great purpose in your creation, to love you and to love others. God, all these things, we desire that they die within our own body. And so, Lord, we we ask that you meet us and teach us now in the word of God. So let our worship continue as we open up the word of the living God. Lord, let every heart praise you and sing to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Well, let's review what we've looked at the last two weeks. Uh, We'll finish up Paul's thoughts on the subject this morning, but uh, we'll go have a picnic after that. And so I'm glad uh, that you are, I see some of you dressed for it. I meant to tell you last week, come in your shorts. This is one Sunday. Don't dress up. We're just going to go to a picnic afterwards. So let's Go fellowship and rejoice over these great truths that we've been learning uh, together. Well, Romans 8, 1 through 4, that was kind of the foundation of, of, I think, the whole Bible, but definitely chapter 8. And I just feel like I should preach them again. So when I finish chapter 8, I I hold the reserve that maybe we'll go back and do verses 1 through 4 again. What we saw in verse 1, that there is right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ, God, Christ came and set us free from the penalty of sin. We were under God's rightful condemnation. There was nothing we could do to get out from under it. So God sent his son into the world and he condemned sin in the flesh in his own son. And we are no longer now under the penalty for our sin. Verse two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And so he didn't just set you free from sin's penalty, but he also set you free from sin's power. It had absolute sway in your life. It ruled and reigned when you were in Adam. And now you've been taken out from that spirit of life and death. And now you're in the spirit, the Holy Spirit of life and peace and righteousness. In verse four, there's a purpose that God has done this. In verse four, in order that this It's called a henna clause. What is the purpose? That the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
And so all of this has been done that we can re- keep the requirement of the law, that now I can love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbors, myself, where before I could never do that. I was a lover of self. I could not love God and love other people in that state. And so our actions now flow not from two tablets of stone, but from a person that we have been married to and joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the exegesis of God the Father. He's the exact representation of God. And he says, now we bear fruit for God by this relationship. So new covenant is not just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, trying to obey the 10 commandments. It's about being joined in a vital union to Jesus Christ. And from that relationship will now bear fruit for God called love to him and love to other people. So how do we do that? We do it by the Spirit. We do it by walking by the Spirit, by being those who are now according to the Spirit. We are made alive to spiritual realities, and Paul says we are minded now on the Spirit and the things of God. And what's more is this Holy Spirit now is dwelling inside of each one of us, And he's going to raise us from the dead. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And when we finish this life and he comes back, he's going to raise our bodies from the dead. And now, by putting to death, all that disrupts us from this new nature that that just wants to love God and love others. It's called sin. And we're looking at that every believer has remaining sin that fights against this new requirement of the law that we can now fulfill. So by the Spirit that's been put within us, we are to put to death these sins, these sins that lead us to want to love ourselves instead of God and other people. And that is what we've been looking at for the last two weeks. So if you're visiting, I just saved you two hours. You, you owe me coffee. So the call is to put to death the deeds of the body. And we're going to finish up our outline, if you could pull it up for us. In Romans 8, 12 through 13, Paul has given us five elements that we must understand to have victory over our sin as believers. And so our first point, we looked at the foundation. So then, God never commands you to kill sin without a therefore or a so then. And so you're, you're already right with God. You're not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All these realities tie into uh, now as I go to kill sin. Who's the audience that he's writing to? He says the brethren. He's now writing to the sons and daughters of God. I heard this illustration a few years ago, and it just hit me again this week. Is, and they didn't see the movie Chariots of Fire. A lot of the younger people probably have not seen that. You really should. Uh, I'd say rent the VHS, but I think, you, I think there's an easier way nowadays to watch it. But there are these two British men, and they both won gold medals in the Olympics in their running. And they were asked why, why they wanted to win, why they trained so hard and ran so hard, what motivated them. And the first one with the last name of Abrams, he said simply this, when the gun goes off, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. And if I win, then I matter. And as a pastor, I watch some of you do that day to day. And you're trying to prove your existence. And if I can do enough and live enough and maybe uh, bear enough fruit, I I deserve to exist and I prove I belong and I, I can go another year. And what I want you to see, that is not the Christian life. You're not running to prove your existence. But Eric Little said this, He said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I run as a man already justified and right with God, and I just feel his pleasure running and doing what he made me to do. That's why we run Southside. That's why it's brethren. I feel the pleasure of God as I run for his name and for his name's sake. And so I, I, brethren, let's go put to death that which is opposed to our God who has given us everything for this redemption. Our duty, third point, we're called to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And that that Greek word or that term that the Puritans loved so much was to put it in the morgue, to mortify it. So we're not to manage sin, we're to put it to death. 
and we're going we're gonna to go after it now to, to annihilate it, to, to break its lifeline and stream and flow, and we want to put to death these sins of self and everything that keeps us from loving God and loving other people. So our duty, it's your duty, you, put to death the deeds of the flesh. And then we looked at our fourth point, trying to understand this. What is the means? Because in my own strength, I can't kill any sin. I've never been able to put anything to death in my own strength, except food or whatever, something in the kitchen. <laughs> Terrible in it. So the means is by the Spirit. And we looked at in Galatians, do you get just sanctified? Do we grow in our Christian life by the works of the flesh, by just trying or by hearing and believing the word of God? And Paul says, by hearing this word and believing it. So it's not enough to just keep learning truth and doctrine and filling up your notebooks. I got to believe what the word of God says and the spirit is going to reveal Christ and show him to me in his word. And as that comes and it's more real to me, it begins to put to death sin. And so I said, I asked myself one question in battling sin, but really two and the first thing is, what am I not believing? When, when sin comes, there's some truth of God's word that I'm not believing right now. And then the second is, what lie am I believing? That my flesh is telling me the devil and the world, they're, they're telling me this is going to make you happier than God. And so there's something that I'm not believing, and there's a lie that I am believing. And the Spirit causes us both to will and to do His good pleasure and to put to death sin by believing the word of God. And what it says. And I, I don't know why I got to exhort the church of God in my own heart to believe what the Word of God actually says. And when we believe it, we're going to begin to put to death the lies and the things that are coming into our lives and tempting us away from God that it will be better than Him. And when I believe these truths, I, I know there's nothing better than God. And when I stay there, sin has no draw and attraction to my heart. Number five. So that, that's review. And this morning, there's these promises now that I want to talk about. And the promises are very interesting in verse 12. Brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. <clears throat> For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. And I'll tell you right now, that is not a physical death because believers and unbelievers will have a physical death. This is a spiritual death in our passage. And so if you live according to this flesh, and you remember according to the flesh is being controlled and dominated by it. It's all, you live in that realm and you think in it. If you live in that realm, you must die. But if by the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, everything we've studied for the last two weeks, what will happen? You will live. You will have eternal life. And so what a sobriety that these words bring now after everything we've been studying in this passage. We, we've been looking at mortifying sin. We've been looking at being according to the flesh or according to the spirit. And now Paul comes and drops these weighty eternal ends of which course you take, of which course you run on your days of earth. One ends in death and one ends in life. If you're living according to the flesh, you will die. And if you're living according to the Spirit, that's kind of the parallel that I was expecting and waiting for Paul to drop on us. If you live according to the flesh, you die. If you live according to the Spirit, you live. But he doesn't do that. He rather says, but if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is eternal life. This is to live with God forever, which I pray everyone in this room wants or you wouldn't be here. I want to live with God forever. And the one who's putting to death the deeds of the flesh, he says, will live. So the weight of this passage just got weightier, didn't it? It was already weighty to me. I didn't need any more weight. Thank you, Paul. But now there are two eternal destinations at the end of these two courses that have to be talked about. And they're just diametrically opposed. You can't have anything more opposite than life and death. The reaping from a life lived according to the flesh will be eternal perdition. And the reaping of the one who engages in this battle by the Spirit and you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live that long, tiresome battle that finishes and says, I kept the faith. I've finished the race. Now there's stored up for me the crown of life. 
You get this one if you're in the battle, don't you? You're so weary and tired. And, and to know, man, I'm going to finish. And I'm going to get the, the soldier's reward. So if a believer... This wakes up someone who's been rocked to sleep in their fight against sin, doesn't it? It just kind of wakes you up. And if you're drifting and meandering and coasting American Christianity, floating around by the waves and the winds of this world, whatever they say, I believe, I think, I walk like, taking the world and its thoughts and ways and fellowshipping with it and playing with it, and saturating yourself in it, and getting your thoughts and hopes from it, living for the scene, that is all there is. So believer, wake up. Either you're putting sin to death, or it's putting you to death. Paul doesn't give us any in-between here this morning. And if you're an unbeliever, it's probably going to bounce right off what I just said. You're bored. I can already see it on a couple faces. Close your eyes and catch a little sleep and come back next Sunday. My parents made me come here. This is awful. Why does this pastor get so stirred up every Sunday? (laughs) Preach, brother. Or all you talk about is how bad this world is, and that just fills your mind and your heart all day long. For me, it's bad out there. But I think my greatest burden is how bad it is in here. That keeps me up more than how bad it is out there. And so maybe let's check our hearts as we begin this morning. What's been your response to the last two weeks? Has it just gone in one ear and out the other and you're just back to meandering again? Or like some of the texts I got this week of the saints of God who are killing sin by the Spirit. I love it. No matter what is said in this word, you're just going to keep going on playing games with God and giving all your time and attention and concern and worry to this world, to the scene, and to the flesh. And that makes these words really matter. If I live according to the flesh, you will die. If you put to death the deeds of the Spirit, you will live. It's really big. And so the first question for me, and it must be answered right away, as I hope you're saying it right now, is, wait a minute, Pastor, we spent two years going through Romans, and and I spent my whole time locked up during COVID with you preaching on total depravity and the wrath of God that's revealed against sin. I'm already suffering, and you're doing this to me while I turn on a live stream for a year to show you that there was nothing that you could do to to shut your mouth before God and silence you, to show you that the law cannot fix your sin. Morality will never fix it. We came to a but now in Romans 3.21. But now God has made a way to save sinners. And it was justification that God's son came and did what we couldn't do. He loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength and his neighbor as himself. 24-7, he fulfilled the law's demands in my place. And then he died in my place on a cross, bearing the wrath of God so that all my sins are forgiven. And I sit here this morning with no condemnation upon me. I love it. I've been turning it around from every angle in Romans and adoring it. Chapter 5, while you're sinners, he did this. It's just this diamond called Christ. And every angle, though the way the light hit it was beautiful. Sparkled and dazzled every time in fresh new ways. I want to preach it again. I'm going to start up a community group on Romans and start it again. And then after all of that, Pastor, you spent way too much time on therefore to show you that you live out of a justified, accepted life, that everything is lived in this reality, and the only sin that you can ever overcome is forgiven sin. Sin that's been conquered and paid for, right? Right? And now we're sitting in a passage that says, if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death the body, you'll live. Just sounds like works and religion all over. I spent two years to take that citadel down. Is it being raised back up? The power of eternal life or death are bound up in how I fight sin, how I live towards it. 
Before I answer that question, what it means, I, I want to start by what it doesn't mean. And what this doesn't mean is that you will get justified right with God, accepted this morning by putting to death the deeds of the flesh. I've tried that for 10 years. It does not work. Why do I say that? Paul's whole argument and journey in this letter has been to show you that you can only get right with God through the work of Jesus Christ. Justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the law, but by faith in Christ alone. We saw that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The whole letter has been to show that by fighting sin and trying to live according to God's law can never make you right with God. It puts you right back under the law. To live a certain way is the way to get God's favor. Instead of looking to Jesus who lived a certain way and he earned God's favor in your place. We believe at this church that the scriptures teach that you are saved by grace alone. God has done it all in his son through faith in him alone by the work of Christ alone. There's no other way to get right with this God. And just look at what this whole chapter is teaching. I want to remind you one more time, what is it anchored by? Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation right now for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the end, um, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So the whole thing is showing you security. It's showing you that once you're in the safe refuge of Christ, you can never be brought back under wrath or condemnation or a charge can never be brought against you. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called And these these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. This is a whole chapter to show you eternal security that nothing can snatch you out of God's hand. But what I do is sin is going to snatch me out. So I want you to see right away, that isn't it. What is the argument of the chapter is you're given the spirit and God will never lose you. He will bring you to glory. That spirit will raise you from the dead. And it's not unless you fight sin and put it to death. If you don't, you will die. No way. That is not what he's teaching. So what is this saying? And I hope that you're stirred up to at least want to know. What is this saying? Well, exactly what the whole epistle has been saying since we started it. Romans 3, 9, you're all under the dominion of sin, Jew or Gentile. Whether you're religious or irreligious, moral, immoral, you're all under the rule and reign of sin. You're dominated by it. You won't have God rule over your life. You're at enmity with God in your heart. And then the Bible said in Romans 1, you either reject him by creation, knowing there's a God, I won't deal with you, or you reject him with God's law and you you teach everybody what to do while you do the opposite. He says you're both rejecting God, whether you're religious or amoral, immoral. It's just you're, you're God rejectors from the heart. Why? Because you're according to the flesh. You've been born of Adam. And you can only live for the scene and your lust and your pleasures. And he says, nothing can break that. There's no human power that can break that nature that controls you and dominates you. There's only one power that will ever be able to break it, but now. And if you say you're a Christian and are according to the flesh this morning, you will die. I have a gospel for you this morning. And that you need to be condemned for that sin. And what the law could never do, change your heart and set you free. His own son did in verse 3. And God sent him in the world and he was condemned in your place. So that your sins were punished. And you can be set free and no longer according to the flesh. So Jesus offers to everyone sitting in this room, there's a way to come out. So you won't die. Come to Christ. And he'll set you free. So what is this saying? What this whole epistle's been saying. If you have come to faith in Christ alone and been joined to him, the penalty of sin is taken care of and its reigning ruling power in your life has been broken. You have the spirit of God inside you. You have a new relationship to sin and to this world. And we now have, have, have as our ambition to be pleasing to Christ. So put to death 
what God has caused you to hate in the core of your being. You remember that Lloyd-Jones quote? How can you look at what put Jesus on a cross and say, I want to continue in it? The one who rules your life, the Holy Spirit, hates sin more than anyone in the universe. Make sin your enemy, not your friend. Anything that leads you away from love to God and love to others, put it to death by the Spirit of God, by hearing and believing the Word of God. And if you do this, you will live. Every believer will do this. And you will fight this. And you will engage in this battle. And you will receive eternal life for what Jesus did on the cross and in his life. So get this. Your fight against sin and your gradual victories against sin are the signs of life, not the way to life. So I want you to catch that. This fighting sin is the sign of life, not the way to life. This is an eternal difference in that statement. Making war on your sin is the sign that you are joined to Jesus Christ and his spirit is dwelling within you. It's a sign of life, not the way of life. And this is the difference between reigning sin. Reigning sin, you must die. Remaining sin, you fight by the spirit to put it to death and you'll live. So what does this do for me? God is so good. He gives us so many motivations to love and good deeds. To live a life for Him. My greatest is Jesus. Hanging on a cross in my place. I can't look at that and not hate sin. I love the cross. So He's going to come again. He's coming back to make all things new. And that without faith, it's impossible to please him because we believe that he is and he's the rewarder of those who have faith in him. And so many battles have been fought on the sod of this world. Many have given their lives in battles, battles that they didn't even know if they could win. Some for good and righteous reasons, some just for power and dominion, some for revenge, some for freedom. But this is the only battle that truly matters. And I don't want to give my whole life to a battle that isn't eternal. Maybe just take that in right now. Are you giving yourself to a battle that isn't eternal? Like that's all you're about? That's all you talk about and think about? The good old U.S. of A.? The promise for the one who enters this battle by faith and fights it by faith every day in every high and stormy gale And the good times and the bad, the highs and lows, warm and cold, when God seems near and when he seems far, when you're full of joy and when you're full of depression, the reward will far outweigh the cost. The reward is worth the battle. And I just want you to hear that word this morning, life, eternal life, old pilgrim, life, life, eternal life. When all that entails, the whole Bible can't contain it. If I had to summarize it, it's Jesus is going to be there forever. To get the reward, there's a great battle, child of God. But the Spirit is put within us so that we're sure to win. We're sure to get there. But to get to the place called paradise, eternal rest, I have to fight the good fight of faith as a child of God. And we are closer to the end than when we first believed in Romans 13. Therefore, the one who by the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the body, he's the one who is a justified believer and can never make final peace with sin. I want you to catch that. He goes on fighting until he puts his sword of the Spirit down. And so I'm going to lose some battles, but I will not lose the war. And so I'm going to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what Paul is saying to us this morning. So with that added weight, this cannot be optional. This is what the Spirit does inside of a child of God. I fall and I fail, but a righteous man gets up seven times and fights again. And what I love looking out at this body is I've watched some of you fall again and again, and you just keep getting up 
and you won't stop because of the glory that you've seen in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm the uh, Inigo Montoya of Christianity. <laughs> you killed my brother. Prepare to die. You can stab me, cut me, slice me, but I won't quit fighting to avenge that which killed Christ. By the Spirit of God, I will win. The grace of God guarantees it that you're going to win this battle. Isn't that good news? If it was up to you, just leave. Get out of this. Walk away. But because of the Spirit of God, we're, all, we're going to win. I can't lose. And so I will keep fighting sin by the Spirit within me, by hearing the Word of God and believing. Spirit always leads me to repentance. And he renews my love for Christ to engage in this battle again. So if you're weary and been losing, I want you this morning to look at the cross of Christ and get up again by his power, his spirit, to fight this. I've lost many battles, but I will win this war because it's signed in the blood of Christ and promised by God who cannot lie. He even took an oath, I swear by God, that I will finish what I started. And so I thank God with all my heart that I'm not under the law with my performance to get my acceptance, but I'm under grace that I, I'm loved and accepted by God and I can never come out from under that place. Sweetest place to live. All right, that was for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna look at one last thing and we're gonna close out and go have a picnic. So we looked at mortification. I'm gonna give you a quote by John Owen, the great Puritan. The believer's goal is unceasingly starve and subdue his remaining sin nature, seeking its gradual annihilation. He does this by God's grace. All the while knowing that sin won't breathe its last gasp until this life is over, and that if he ever lets up in his attempts, it heals its wounds and it recovers strength. We're in a battle, and by the Spirit, hearing with faith. And then what feeds the flesh, the scene and its thinking, staying up all night pondering a wrong that was done to you or looking at the internet in wrong ways. I was sharing a social media report, you know, we get how much time you were on it. I wish God would give us that at the end of the week. How much time were you in the means of grace? And so that's what we're going to close out this little section on as we got to mortify it. And we need to, what, what we call vivification. And vivification is the, the way I fight this, is I got to believe. And I need to get in, the, God's given me means to stir up my faith and to strengthen it so that I'll believe these truths and live upon them and not be drawn into the lies that come my way. So thank you, God, that, that you've given me your spirit and these means to stir up grace within me, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it, it's really important uh, is to starve sin, but I must feed the faith within. I must put off and put on. And so I got to be feeding this faith. Absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. It makes it grow harder. So I need to grow and give life to the hope within me, to my hope in Christ, to my belief in this gospel, to the things of the Spirit. And I have found that they, they die quickly if they're not fed. It's like a teenage boy. <laughs> I had three of them, and man, did I just, my budget was ridiculous. <laughs> I can drive to church, and I can pour over the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 23, and I just never want to sin again. Just love it. I'm so committed to Him, His name, His kingdom, His will. Hallowed be your name, God. Lead me not into temptation today. This is going to be so easy because nothing sounds good to me right now but Jesus. And in a very short time, sometimes minutes, hours on a good day to forget how taken up I was with Christ. And now I'm taken up with some bait that Satan's thrown out there that's looking better than God himself. And so I need to keep giving life to my faith in Christ alone. And all that entails life, eternal life. That the seen is not my hope. I have to starve it. I have to weaken it. I, I can't take in the world by bucketfuls and wonder why I'm so dead. I need to take in the means of grace that God has given to his children to keep their hope and their love alive. 
their relationship with him vibrant and full. And Jude, keep yourselves in the love of Christ. John Owen again said, in the sanctification of believers, the Holy Ghost does work in them, in their whole souls, their minds, their wills and affections, a gracious supernatural habit, principle and disposition of living unto God. We take in the means of grace and they stir up a desire to be pleasing to God. What gifts God has given to the people of God. And they must be employed by the child of God if you're to remain and stay vigilant in this battle to put to death the deeds of the body. So what are they? Before I pop them up, I got another slide. I got a whole bunch of slides this morning. You're not getting out of here for a while because there's a picnic. I'm going to feed you. You don't have to run out and get food. So just stay with me. So first, I spent many years and sadly enough, a decade, thinking that the means of grace were magic. And you just did them, and faith sprung up. I did my Robert Murray McShane Bible reading religiously. You read through the whole Bible, the New Testament twice, and Psalms and Proverbs. And and if you just read the Bible, a scripture day keeps the devil away, and you just do the means. You just go to church. I did church. You just do all these things, and that's how you grow. Right? Huh. By the Spirit. And by the Spirit... I need to see Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Strengthen me in my inner man. So from these means of grace, they're not just to say you did them and now you're religious and a nice guy. You do them to enliven your faith and your soul and your hope and your love. I need them. I got to fight for it. I got to be disciplined to hear and believe. And so we have what's called a private means and a public means of grace. And I'm just going to go over these so quickly. Um, can you pop them up there? Are they? Oh, look at that. Who's over that? Wayne, our newbie is killing it. Make, make him the, the main guy up there, okay? He should be running this show. That brother's good. Uh, the private means that God has given us is personal Bible reading. I think the greatest gift that I have. The Holy Spirit dwells in me to stir it up. Who inspired the Word of God? The Holy Spirit inspired, so I have God-breathed words And I want to get in that word and meditate and memorize and read. And every time I open that word, Holy Spirit, show me Jesus, the fulfillment of this whole thing. It's not just, I read, I'm done. Who is the guy that built the orphanages in Bristol? Who? George Mueller. George Mueller. And they said, how long do you have a quiet time for? And he said, I don't stop until my heart is sweetened on Christ. And some days it takes 10 minutes and some days it takes four hours. What what did he go to the word for? To see Jesus. Second, personal reading of Christian literature. And I mean good Christian literature with people, men and women who have shown us Christ from things that they've learned in their journey. And what a means of grace to learn from those who have gone before us and are advanced. Personal prayer The greatest privilege we have is a walkie-talkie to heaven to ask God for help in this battle to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Personal praise, worship. Get in your secret place. It's the only place I can sing as loud as I want and it bothers nobody. Personal praise, a watchfulness. I got to know my weaknesses and what are the things that I fall and struggle with and I need a watchfulness to watch and stay alert. And then a self-examination, not every two minutes, but just seasonal. Where am I at? Am I growing? What are my struggles? Some time alone with God. If anything in American culture is to get you to not slow down and think and meditate and examine where I'm at. If I can keep you busy enough, you'll never deal with your soul and just keep you moving. The public means, as we have the public preaching and teaching, to give yourself to it, to come and learn. No matter who opens the Word of God, anywhere I go, anyone who opens the Word, I just want to learn it, hear it, show me. Anytime the Bible's read, you can grow. And so I want you to give yourself to the public preaching and teaching, and even on Sunday mornings to prepare your hearts. Expository preaching is you know the next passage. And so get your hearts ready and prepare and come and get the wax out of your ears so that you can hear the Word of God. And get up 
I, I actually go to bed at 7 o'clock on Saturday nights. <laughs> Not because I like to. Get, get to bed early. Get fresh. Quit coming in here after three in the mornings and wonder why you fall asleep during every one of the past. Oh, it's not just that. It's me as well. I'll, I'll take it. I'll wear it. Okay, it's both. There's something beautiful about public prayer where you pray with other people too. And uh, some of my best moments in my Christian life are when other people are pouring out their hearts before God. I love it. Give yourself to public praise where we, we'd be encouraged and strengthened. And any of you who are struggling this morning, I hope when we were singing those words, your hearts were just being lifted by the corporate saints, praising God and singing to him. There's a means of grace in public praise. And then the ordinances that when we, next Sunday, we're going to do communion to come and to drink the fullest of what we can get and remembering what Christ has done for us and the joy of our baptisms and new believers. And then fifthly, the fellowship with believers, we talked about a little in Sunday school that in Ephesians 4, the body causes the growth of the body. And if anything in the American culture is to stay isolated. And the way God has designed this means of grace is we get into each other's lives and we stir each other up in love to Christ. We, we see sin and we pray for each other and confront each other. And it, we, we have to be open. We have to be vulnerable. We got to be present. That doesn't happen uh, by yourself. And so I'm just going to keep pushing you on this again and again and again for your good, because I want you to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And, and it's never easier than when I do it with a team. I love having people in my life praying, helping in this battle. And then service. To be serving the Lord is an amazing means of grace. Jesus says, if you uh, obey me and follow me, he says, the Father and I will disclose ourselves to you. you. You keep your heart alive in the love of Christ as we follow him. And so in closing then, we do these to stir up one another unto love and good deeds. The Hina clause, the whole fulfillment of the law, and the whole reason he's, that the condemnation has been set free and you've been broken from the power of sin is that we might love like no other. That we would love God and other people and put to death these sins that keep me from that. So what a call to this body. What a call to each person individually this morning. I've never seen anyone make a whole lot of progress in their faith alone. It happens, but the ones that I've watched grow in the 22 years of this church are the ones that gave themselves to this. And I don't know anyone who's done that who hasn't grown. God uses means. Those who have given themselves to the body of Christ have just blossomed. And so you know what's happening to me is as I'm studying Romans 8, these realities are just getting better to me than sin. And I believe them. And mortification has begun to flourish. I got miracle grow all over my soul in Romans 8. And I got round up on my sin. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Are you done managing sin? And are you ready to mortify it by the Spirit, Southside Bible Church? And I was going to close out. Can you put up that slide just for the fun of it? Wayne is killing it this morning. I just love this. I was going to go over like three or four sins like I was going to last week, and I'm out of time. But I'll just run through it so quickly. Is when you sin... Um, Maybe I'll just do one then. Let's take the sin of anger. Um, justification is usually anger is, is there's just something not right in my heart and I just want to put it on an object and something's bothering me. And if I can just preach that I'm right with God and he loves me, and he accepts me on the finished work of Jesus, it takes away that bothersome anger and struggle. And there's just something about justification that heals all things. And then reckon. Paul said to reckon that you're dead to sin and alive to God. I don't have to be angry the rest of my life. This, this, I heard this one guy say to me, I'm Italian. I have a right to be angry. <laughs> you're a child of God. You don't. Reckon. You're dead to that. You're not that any longer. You're not a debtor to the flesh. You don't have to give your members your lips to yell at your spouse and your kids. Thirdly, you're not under law, but you're under grace. I don't have to perform to get your acceptance. I'm loved. This angry, battling sinner is loved by God. Does wonders for you. 
Fourthly, get your mind on the things of the Spirit, what really matters. And what I'm so upset about is always temporal. Number five, mortify, hear and believe. Put to death what it is. There's something that you want so badly that you're angry because you're not getting it or someone's scaring you or tempting you with it. Hear and believe these words. Number six, Paul said, don't yield your members to it. Your will be done. God, I'm I'm done lashing out like a time bomb on everybody and anybody. Number seven, vivify the means of grace. Pray. Bring the scriptures that you've memorized. The the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And you're like an unguarded city. And all these things stir up again. When I know I'm loved by God, my anger always dissipates. Just come back. And then contemplate what is promised is the the path to death and misery and what God has promised and the path to eternal joy and happiness. If I put to death these sins, I'm going to reign and live with him forever. Let's go have a picnic. I smell dead sin. I love it. (laughs) Keep it up. Father, help us. We are a needy people and we want to put to death these sins that we've coddled and cuddled and and just uh, fed. Lord, by the cross of Jesus Christ, we want to put to death what put him to death on that cross. We're no longer friends with it. Lord, it tempts us, it teases us. We still have remaining sin that gets aroused by it. And we thank you that you put your Holy Spirit within us to put those things to death. Remaining sin is no match for the Spirit of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. God, give confidence to the children of God. Take away any confidence in their own flesh, their own strength, their own willpower. And let their strength be in the promises of God alone. Not by strength, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. God, may we learn how to put these things to death by the Spirit of God. And I just thank you for this beautiful passage and what we've learned. And I pray the fruit will be people who are not unloving, but a people growing in love towards you and love toward one another. God, would that be the aroma and the fruit of Southside Bible Church because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let any discouraged, worn out brother or sister be encouraged again that right now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For anyone who comes to faith in Christ, there's no condemnation. They are not back under your condemnation. Let it free them. Let it stir them up again to love and good deeds. God, I thank you for this, and it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.